AM 760 KFMB. Now back to the lawyer in blue jeans on AM 760 KFMB. My name is Justin Isaac, and uh, we have a guest, actually, that we want to bring on in just a second here. Uh, his name is Steve Schwartz, and he is what you would call an LSAT expert. The LSAT is the, the test that you would take in order to get into law school. Um, and, you know, this is kind of topical as well, and I don't, this is, I don't think this is political, really. I think this is just um, kind of a, a shame that we even have something like this going on. There's a college admissions scandal out there uh, that a lot of people have been talking about, and it's pretty, I don't want to say pathetic, but it's pretty sad. Um, give us a call, 1-800-760-KFMB, 1-800-765-362. There's some I, – I was looking through the names of all the people who have been caught up in it, and there's been a lot of – there's been a few local people here in San Diego, too. The owner – the former owner of this radio station is caught up in the scandal, and she, I believe, is in Boston uh, – at a, at a court case or court hearing, sorry, um, about this, uh, the preliminary hearing. So um, there's been a few people. There's someone who paid $120,000, $400,000, $450,000, $251,000 Facebook stock. There's been so many people. Um, Elizabeth Kimmel is the one who uh, used to own k and and she's accused of this uh, or in, involved in this uh, allegedly as well. Um, and so there, if you do not know what was been, what's been going on with this scandal, um, basically what people were doing, pay, parents were doing, was paying a middleman, middle person, whatever you want to call it, and having them get their children into prestigious or you know, favored schools for, in exchange for money. Um, and it would somehow, I don't know exactly how they, well, they would, I guess, pay off the coaches too, because what they would do is they would say, oh, this person is a, a potential uh, rowing, you know, uh, student athlete or uh, tennis or volleyball, even though they didn't really play that sport. So they would get in and not necessarily get, uh, you know, scholarships or anything like that, but these parents didn't care about that because they had plenty of money to do it. They're spending 400 something thousand dollars to get into USC and, and, you know, other schools that you – know, I don't understand why that was that big of a deal. But anyways, it looks like it happened with USC a lot. So the, uh, the athletic department in USC is going to be in more – again. Um, but there was another person from Del Mar. So it got me thinking about, like, law school scandals and LSAT scandals. And so Steve Schwartz is joining us. He is our, our LSAT guru. Uh, Steve, thank you for joining us. And I was looking through your resume. You have a pretty good resume. You've been on some, uh, some other news networks, and, uh, and you've, done, you've been doing this for a while, over 10 years. Wow. Okay. So there was uh, the LSAT – well, I, I, I'm sorry, the college admission scandal, and I'm sure you've seen it very firsthand over there because a lot of people in New York – were kind of involved in this, and uh, there's some there's been some scandals that we didn't know about with the LSAT and with other uh, college admissions. Uh, can you kind of go into that for us? This college admission scandal is obviously noteworthy because of how large it is, really. But there have been a number of other standardized test cheating attempts and successful ones as well over the years. Um, in New York, where I'm based, in Great Neck, Long Island. There was the case of a high school student taking the SAT for many other kids as well and getting paid thousands of dollars to do it, getting offered a boat, things like that. That eventually got busted. There's a 60 Minutes segment about it on YouTube that's pretty entertaining where he went in depth on that. Now, the LSAT, though, and other grad level exams have had their own cheating attempts as well. For the LSAT back in February 1997, two students met a third guy at a bar and paid him to go into the test center and steal a test booklet, then transmit the answers to them via pager in Hawaii. So they were based they were based in California, and then they hired someone there. Then they flew to Hawaii to take the LSAT, and then took advantage of the time difference to get answers trim, transmitted to them via pager. Remember, this is back in 1997. And so ever since then, the Law School Admission Council has banned any kind of electronics in the test center, whether it be a pager, a beeper, a cell phone, anything else like that. Wow. 
<clears throat> that sounds very uh, futuristic. What did you say? That was 1997? <laughs> and I, I imagine that there are other ways of communication that we don't even really know about, um, that it, the technology is just ever growing. You know, it's, so, it's such a, a big field. Of, and I'm, I'm assuming cheating is, too, because it's such an important thing for so many people, and it means so much money. So uh, that is a crazy, crazy case. I'm going to have to watch that 60 Minutes. Overall, with test security, it's always an arms race. Uh, the Law School Mission Council hires a test security firm called Cavion, or Cavon, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, C-A-V-E-O-N. So there are testing security firms that go around to you know, the college board, educational testing service, law school admission council, because once again, of course, the stakes are so high with these standardized tests, given that it's just a simple single number you get in a single day, whereas, of course, your GPA you earn over the course of four years. Yeah. And I remember when I took the, um, the LSAT, it was pretty strict. There was someone... I think there was someone in the bathroom watching to make sure you weren't going to like your backpack or to your phone or something like that. But for the bar, you have to leave your backpack in a in an area that's not very secured. But there's a lot of proctors around. There's a lot of security around too. So it is something that they take extremely seriously. Um, and if you get caught with anything really, then you're kind of automatically out. So the stakes are extremely high, but um, it is uh, it, obviously for good reason too. And for law especially, I think it's it's incredibly important given, you know, you have to go before the bar, you have to be admitted as a JD, you have to pass the character and fitness portion of that, and you have to disclose any disciplinary issues or criminal records before you even apply to law school. And so if you fail to disclose something, you could potentially go through three years of law school and then never be able to practice law. And of course, an LSAT cheating attempt is definitely going to be a big barrier. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people don't know that fact. If you, you <laughs> this is very uh, important to know, make sure you check with a, a bar lawyer if you've had disciplinary issues before you actually go to law school, because you could, in theory, go through law school, like you just said, and pass the bar and still not get your law license because of a, a DUI or some other kind of disciplinary issue that's come up in the past. So you have to have a special accommodation if something is particularly egregious. So um, how, let's see here, um, how were people able to cheat? Uh, how do you think that, um, how were they able to cheat through the, for the, was the security just not good enough back then um, for these kids taking tests for other people and other, other methods of cheating? With that SAT example, the, ex the security was definitely too lax. And you'll see that in the 60 minutes segment that you know, the testing security folks, you know, they're, they're very concerned about this and they have to change things. But we, we saw from that case that the proctors at these high schools, they're not really looking very closely. They're kind of just smiling and nodding and waving people in without closely matching the photo to the person in front of them or even making sure that the ID is a secure one. You know, a high school ID with some simple lam laminate, you know, anybody can do that. You know, it's not as if it's a government ID where it's scanned and more serious. With the LSAT, with the LSAT example, I think it was you know, literally someone was in. They paid someone to go into the room and steal the booklet. The person kind of ran out of the room. The proctor chases them down. The guy pulls a knife on the proctor, and of course, he ends up getting caught in the end. So, I don't think there was anything they could have done to prevent that. But obviously, you're not going to get away with something like that. And these days, of course, with security cameras everywhere, I think it'd be pretty easy to track somebody down. Yeah, I, I think that the, there's, these things are under lock and key. I mean, maybe the only way to protect uh, someone wielding a knife like that would be if you had an armed guard. I don't know how practical that is. So, um, But you know what, Steve? We actually have to take our, our, for our second break here. So um, stick with us. We're actually going to come back on the other side of the break and talk a little bit more about the LSAT and some other uh, issues with the scandal. This is the Lawyer in Blue Jeans show. Uh, give us a call if you'd like to, 1-800-760-KFMB, 1-800-765-362, and we'll be back right after this. We are talking about the college admission scandal right now and, uh, the, and some scandals that have come up over the years that I didn't even really know about with um, the LSAT and some other cheating scandals. So we, we do have Steve Schwartz on the line, New York, and uh, Steve is our LSAT guru or LSAT expert. So Steve, uh, you, thank you for joining us again, but what about 
Have there been other scandals with other standardized tests like the GRE or um, do you know any any other scandals like that? The biggest scandal I can think of with the GRE is actually from test prep companies themselves, believe it or not. You know, there's this big incentive, of course, to get your students the best scores possible because then they thank the company and get business and such like that. But so what happened with the GRE is that they reuse a lot of test questions. They, it's computerized. They have a big database of them but there was actually a very limited set of questions they were using. So they kind of give them again and again and again. So test prep folks could go in, memorize the questions, write them down the second they get outside, and then use them on their students to prepare them for future tests. Wow. That is a lot different than uh, bar prep was, that's for sure. Because uh, when we had to take uh, the bar for, you, you have to take two portions of the bar. It's uh, actually a the written portion and the multiple choice portion that the L L S L S A C law school admissions council, I believe it is, um, is the one who administers and they come up with new questions every single year. Like nothing is even close. And those questions are so ridiculously hard that just when you think you are getting them right, or you think you're getting a handle on them, you're not absolutely not. So the fact that you have programs that are, or the company the, it's supposed to be, you know, testing uh, the knowledge of these students, and it's really just testing the memory. Is that correct? Well, for the GRE, it was in a way. A lot of students will just cram these old questions. They walk in, and then, of course, they know the answers. And the GRE has sent, since adjusted things so that that's not so easy to do anymore. But the funny thing with the LSAT now, actually, is that it's going from being administered four times a year to as many as nine or ten times a year going forward. And they're also digitizing it at the same time. And so, as you said, the LSAC, they make new questions every year. They've been releasing consistently three new exam forms per year. But now that they're going to be administering it much more frequently, they're not able to develop quite as many new LSAC questions as they used to to meet the new demand. So as a result, they are actually, believe it or not, reusing a lot of old questions. What they'll do is they'll take the questions they administered overseas and give them to students in the US, or they'll take the exams that were administered to a Sabbath observer on a Monday and give them to someone on a future LSAT test date on a Saturday. But obviously there is potential for abuse here. Yeah, and that and, and, and that makes sense too. So you said they're going from four tests uh, a year to nine tests a year, and can you explain why? Well, for the GRE, it was in a way, a lot of students will just cram these old questions. They walk in and then of course they know the answers. And the GRE has sent, since adjusted things so that that's not so easy to do anymore. But the funny thing with the LSAT now actually is that it's going from being administered four times a year to as many as nine or 10 times a year going forward. And they're also digitizing it at the same time. And so as you said, the LSAC, they make new questions every year. They've been releasing consistently three new exam forms per year. But now that they're going to be administering it much more frequently, they're not able to develop quite as many new LSAC questions as they used to to meet the new demand. So as a result, they are actually, believe it or not, reusing a lot of old questions. What they'll do is they'll take the questions they administered overseas and give them to students in the US, or they'll take the exams that were administered to a Sabbath observer on a Monday and give them to someone on a future LSAT test date on a Saturday. But obviously, there is potential for abuse here. Interesting. So there are schools out there, though, that are now accepting uh, the GRE as opposed to the LSAT or in conjunction with the LSAT? So they're offering, they're, t they're taking both. They're taking both. It started with, I think, University of Arizona was one law school that starting, started accepting GRE scores in addition to LSAT scores. But then more recently, Harvard started doing the same. And once Harvard does something, then everyone down the line feels comfortable doing it as well. So it is spreading quite a bit. But it's really used primarily more for people with STEM backgrounds, at least among the top 14 law schools. Yeah, so I, I understand the logic behind it, because when you have someone taking the GRE, that kind of that's for um, and if anyone doesn't know, the GRE is what you would take to get into graduate school, right, for all different types of subjects. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so like a master's or a PhD, typically maybe more humanities or more science, but definitely not law. Okay, so that and I understand the the reason behind it. They want to obviously reach more people. There has been a drastic decline in uh, law school admissions slash applicants, um, and we've seen it. You know, at our own one of our own universities, the one that I went to, Thomas Jefferson School of Law, has had some major issues, and they've been in the news for a lot of different reasons. But schools are doing trying to get creative to get more people back in there. And it kind of 
is a shame because it sounds that makes it more like a big business as opposed to like we're really just trying to help create new lawyers and and train lawyers and and whatnot. So it seems to me like the, I know this is all big business, and uh, but it's a little bit different when you have a not for profit school as opposed to someone a school that is just trying to make new attorneys. So I don't know. Well, the funny thing is, as we both know, you know these nonprofit universities, they, they do tend to operate more like a business in certain ways. They do have their overhead to meet. They do have big administrative expenses. But the problem is that the LSAT has a strong demonstrated correlation with first year law school grades. And the GRE does, hasn't really been shown to do quite the same. And there is a big investment students are making in the law school admission process. In going to law school, they're taking on massive debt. And you want to know these students are going to succeed in law school and then be able to pass the bar in the end. Yeah, and ultimately that's that's the goal of every law school and um, any uh, program that tries to teach you how to pass the bar, like Barbary or um, Kaplan and you know the other ones as well too. Um, so I, I think you know it, it's I find it to be interesting. Uh, it's kind of evolving. Uh, the the legal field is kind of taking a step back, which is good. It's I think uh, it was going a little too fast, too much. There was too too many attorneys. Uh, being barred in California. And now uh, I think we have the second most attorneys or the most attorneys in um, like for our state. Uh, but I, I can see that this is going to still probably retract a little bit before it gets going again. Um, so I, I don't know. Where do you see it going? Do you think that the GRE is going to be a supplement um, to all the law schools soon? I do think the GRE will probably end up spreading to the majority of law schools because the American Bar Association doesn't really seem to be stopping it. And they have the incentive, of course, to cater to law schools and help them get more applicants. So I do I do think it will continue to spread. But I think the biggest problem will be for the lower tier law schools where they're taking people with GRE scores who couldn't do it on the LSAT. And then they are going to, going to run into a problem down the line. So I think if this continues too far, I'm hoping the ABA or the federal government will step in because they do have an obligation to serve their students well. Yeah, that's true. They they have a vested interest to you know make sure that these because ultimately when you have bad attorneys, it means that the whole field is kind of brought down, and that's why uh, it, it's been it's been in the news a lot recently with the bar results in California. I'm sure you've been paying attention to that. Uh, the bar that I passed was actually the one of the lowest, if not the lowest, uh, bar pass percentage in the history of the bar. I think it was 23% or so, uh, 24%, which is just crazy. It's crazy to think that that many people failed. There was 10,000 plus applicants, I believe, and only 2,400 made it, it or, or something like that. It was crazy. So I know that that's not the norm, but the California Supreme Court has uh, gotten involved because – we need to figure out what what's go where are we going wrong? Is it the the students? Is it you know the LSAT scores, or is it just uh, the the school is not properly training these these students? I don't know. I think that the it's kind of we don't know for sure yet, and I don't know if we will know for a while. So no, it really is a travesty. I think these students graduating with debt, not being able to pass the bar, and then of course if there's an oversupply of lawyers, how do they hang out their own shingle and get some business? So I think that. What we want to do is we want to just help people get the best LSAT scores possible, get into the best law school possible. And my goal, honestly, is to help students go to law school for free or at least with massive scholarship money. And you do that by getting the best LSAT score possible because law schools want people with high LSAT scores because it helps them in the rankings as well. Most definitely. And you know what? We do have to take our last break, but let's uh, let's talk about that on the other side of the break. This is the Lawyer in Blue Jeans show. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to the Lawyer in Blue Jeans show. My name is Jeff Sick, and we have been speaking with Steve Schwartz. And uh, Steve, like I said, is our uh, LSAT guru. And uh, Steve, thank you again for joining us. And we, right before the break, you started to talk about uh, kind of what you do. So why don't you tell everyone what you do? So I'm a full-time professional LSAT coach. I've been coaching the LSAT for over 10 years now. I started off just doing one-on-one -on -one with students here in New York. But then I built a website, LSAT Blog, where I started sharing free LSAT advice on every aspect of the process, as well as law school admissions. From there, I started selling some low-cost prep materials like books, video courses, and now I teach online group classes. I also run the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast, so any of your listeners on the podcast end of things can check it out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere else pretty much. It's, again, the LSAT Unplugged podcast. 
So you're you're very much involved in this, and you're following this from all aspects. Uh, anything that happens with the LSAT, like even on the political side, correct? I try to follow it pretty closely, especially you know the, the past couple of years. There have been so many changes. Uh, one thing we could talk about a little bit if you're interested is the testing accommodation side of things too. Honestly, I think that's the real scandal going on here. This college admission scandal that's happening high in the sky with the celebrities, but I think what's accessible to many more of the 1% families out there is they hire a doctor to give their kid an ADHD accommodation or something like that. The kid gets to go and take the test with 50% extra time or double time and law schools will not know that this applicant received accommodations. Their score is evaluated just the same as everybody else's. And of course, this is a tough issue because some people do deserve the accommodations, but I think there are many more that don't. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I, we actually got into this in law school. I remember um, I knew people with accommodations and I understand that there's reasons for it. And there was, this is kind of a heated debate in one of my classes. Um, in law school, if you have accommodations, you can take the bar instead of taking it over, well, it's a two-day bar now, um, but you can spend three days taking it. You get uh, almost, well, you get 1.5 times the amount of time. So if you have a three-hour test in law school, then you get four and a half hours to take it. And one of the things about a law school test is that it is extremely time sensitive. You have to get out so much information in that three-hour span that it usually is about four hours worth of stuff that you need to do, but you have to do it in three hours. So it is a huge advantage for someone who has accommodations. And like you said, a lot of people need it too, uh, but some people don't and are gaming the system. And that is, yeah, I, I did forget to mention that is a part of the scandal uh, that came about, but ha is there any way to stop that though? Because it's not something like you can run some sort of scientific study. It really just is a doctor asking a student a series of questions or running them through a battery of evaluations. But these are things where it's very easy to to move the dial in one direction or another. And I do think the timing is really important. It's kind of funny, actually. I heard from a student who took the LSAT yesterday on Saturday who took it in the same room, room as Malcolm Gladwell, the famous author. And Malcolm Gladwell has been known to actually critique the LSAT's time constraint a little bit. He thinks that you don't want a lawyer who works quickly. You want a lawyer who takes their time and determines things accurately. But I mean, you're an attorney, Justin. I'm sure you know, like your clients, you know, especially if you're billing them by the hour, they want you to work efficiently. You know, when it comes to the time constraints issue of the test, I had a, a prep teacher, one of our teachers was prepping us for the bar. And he said that if you actually practice law the way bar asks you to take the test, it would be malpractice because it is not, you, you need to be reasonably competent in, uh, in what you're doing. And when you're forcing someone to take a test so quickly and you have zero time, it's not going to be good work. And this is how you, you know, this is malpractice. It could be easily considered malpractice. So yeah, that's a, that's a, a good point that you bring up there. What you do on an exam is different from what you do in the real world, but at the same time, in terms of just what the LSAT is doing, what standardized tests do, whether it's the SAT or the LSAT, there will be future time to work in one's career, whether it's in college or in law school. And so if our goal is to get students to pass the bar for the law school side of things, we want to make sure they have the ability beforehand, before they make that investment, and that's where the LSAT score comes in. Yeah, yeah. Well, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I do want to end on kind of a high note here because we talked about a lot of uh, like a little bit down kind of stuff. There was a 16-year-old from Texas that got admitted into nine law schools, um, and it, she's only yeah 16 years old. She obviously comes from a very smart family um, because she has a, a sibling, a 13-year-old brother who is a freshman in college, and an 11-year-old sister who's a freshman in high school. So they're obviously punching above their uh, their their age group right there. Did you help this one uh, get into these schools? <laughs> no, sadly I didn't, but I read the article about her and it is an incredible story. It kind of just shows that with enough drive and putting in the work, you can achieve incredible results. And I guess on my end, looking at students taking the LSAT, a lot of them do start off with low discouraging scores, but it is possible through hard work, through self-study, to achieve significant score increases and get, get into top 14 law schools. I see it happen all the time. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. Why don't you go ahead and um, throw out your information if you want to uh, for any of the listeners who might want to uh, give you a call or get your information. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you, Justin. So again, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. So go to youtube.com slash LSAT blog or search the LSAT Unplugged podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. Basically anywhere you can get information, it sounds like. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, well, this has been a great show. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Um, if you have a topic that you want us to kind of address, again, we try and stay away from the political, but, you know, let me know. Justin at LawyerInBlueJeans.com. Um, we are, like I said, an estate planning law firm, but we do like to talk about anything legal and wacky cases. So we have, some, uh, we have a good show next week as well for something that is relating to my field, but also a very popular um, author that everyone loves. So we will be talking about that next week. Uh, this has been the Lawyer in Blue Jean Show. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. And when in doubt, use common sense.